Uh, tonight we, uh, we start in a, in a new uh, Bible study series, this time in the book of Judges. Um, we are, uh, we'll be in this for a little while, but, but not, um, not extensively long. Uh, we're going to be looking at this study on a judge by judge basis. And since there's like 12 judges in the book of Judges, um, it, it's, uh, it won't take that long. Now there are a few of those judges, however, that their stories are a little more extensive than others. So whereas some will really fly through, others of them will be camped at for a little while uh, just because they, there's that much material and they're that interesting. So, I mean, you're talking like Samson, Gideon, Deborah. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a few of the judges that are, are uh, very much uh, that much interesting. Now, what, is the, what are the judges? Um, let me read to you a little bit out of uh, chapter 1 here tonight, uh, just because I think the text will explain what this is all about. Uh, verse number 1, chapter 1, After the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, who of us is to go up and be the first to fight against the Canaanite? Uh, the, the important part for our purposes tonight is just really the first verse. Uh, in trying to understand and locate, in maybe in the, from a historical sequence point of view, uh, what we're talking about when we're talking about the judges, we're talking about uh, what was going on amongst the Israelites after Joshua was off the scene. <coughs> Now, um, I think most of us are probably familiar with the early history, right? Uh, Moses leads the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. It takes 40 years to get through the wilderness and into the promised land. Moses was not allowed to lead them into the actual promised land. Joshua had to do that. Uh, Joshua led campaigns to the south, campaigns to the north, and into the central uh, uh, hill country. And most of the land that was allotted to the Israelites by God, um, they also had half-tribes on the, on the eastern side of the Jordan who, who got their territory allotted before anyone else because when they were coming in to the Promised Land, they were withstood by, by some, of those, uh, some of those folks. So um, Judges uh, is just a, a time frame uh, where a certain kind of individual was tasked with some aspect of leading the people of Israel in the time when they were first settling in the Promised Land. Joshua came in and led the initial conquest, but after Joshua uh, passed from the scene, the Israelites were still there. There was still work to be done as far as uh, conquering territory, gaining possessions, and it was still just you know building a nation, building a society. In, in that land that, that um, they were basically visitors to. I mean, they spent all of their history in, in Egypt, and then, you know, a little bit in the, the wanderings, the, the exodus, and now they came into the Promised Land almost as strangers. And so the time of Judges was really a time in which the society of Israel, the nation of Israel, the culture of Israel was really kind of solidified and, and um, really kind of developed a, its own national identity. Now, it did not really reach, excuse me, it really did not reach the pinnacle of those kinds of things until you had, I would say, King David. Uh, before King David uh, and Joshua, that's the time that we're talking about when we talk about the judges. So that, that's where they fit in there. And so during the times of, of the judges, what you had was uh, a group of people in a land trying to be a nation, but really not quite there yet. Trying to be a cohesive people, not quite there yet. And it really would be until uh, really David came along that that, that would change. So that's, uh, that's the judges and the first little bit of introductory comments. Now we'll get to the, the serious introduction here. And that's talking about the, the, uh, the work itself. Um, who wrote the book and when? That's the first question that we uh, will tackle uh, in our introductory uh, comments tonight. Um, we don't know for sure. The book is not attributed within the scriptures anywhere. Um, 
Nowhere. Uh, no one in the New Testament ventured a guess. No one in the Old Testament ventured a guess. And the book itself <coughs> tries to tell you who wrote it. Um, the guesswork uh, leads uh, some of the you know some of the better guesses that have been made anyhow by scholars. Uh, it, uh, for the most part, lead to uh, to Samuel. Uh, Samuel uh, technically was the last of the judges. Um, his sons were fiddling around a bit in there too, but they really, they really were still under the, the leadership of Samuel himself. Samuel would have been the last of these people that we call a judge. Now, he's not included in the book of Judges. He's, he's, he's not included as one of the twelve that we'll look at in the book of Judges. Uh, neither was his predecessor, immediate predecessor, Eli. Um, Eli and, um, uh, and Samuel... Uh, so, uh, we, you, maybe we could call them unincorporated judges. They're not part of the book of judges, but they really did fulfill that function uh, in their lives and for the people of Israel. Um, but um, Samuel had a long, a long, long ministry. And it's thought that he probably was the author of the, this book um, because of these verses there. You see... Um, Verses 17, 6, 18, 1, 19, 1, and 21, 25, all in the book of Judges. All of those verses refer to something that gives a clue as to when the book was written. Um, it doesn't seem like the, these accounts were kept in real time, because when you get to these places, they'll say things like, in that day, they did not have a king. Or they'll say, in that day, everyone did what was right in their his own eyes because they did not have a king or some such like. I mean, they all, all of those verses have that kind of a flavor to them where they are kind of like looking back and saying, these were the days when this condition that is now wasn't. And so, um, you know, if you think about it, who, who would, would have been in a, the best place to be an authoritative figure as far as putting this stuff down and keeping it for posterity uh, being understood as someone who had the anointing of the Lord and could write the, you know, the Word of God, who would that have been that would have had exposure to both the period of the judges and also at least the beginning of the period of the kings? Samuel's that guy, right? Samuel's the one who fits, who, who fits that mold. So it's, it's probably Samuel writing uh, the judges. When did he do it? Probably sometime during the reign of Saul. He had to do something after Saul took over, right? <laughs> he had to do, do something, right? So uh, probably during the reign of Saul. So that was, uh, that was the who and the, the when uh, of the book. Uh, gets us into the next part. Now this is, uh, this is the part that really is an important thing to understand and to hold on to as you go through the book of Judges. Because the structure of Judges is thematic. And so you, what you have is a theme that basically is played out before you with changing details. And what that theme is, is a cycle. A cycle that the people of Israel were going through in their development as a people. And they, they basically kept on going through this cycle. So through the book of Judges, you, you just are repeating this structure over and over again, even though the details, who is involved and whatnot, has changed. Who is the judge involved has changed. But this structure remains. It's, it's virtually the same in, in almost, uh, you know, almost exactly. But it's, it's virtually the same, if, if not actually spoken, it, it's inferred, or we can infer it from what is there uh, spoken. Um, and some folks will say it's a four-part cycle. If you want to see it as a four-part, that's okay. I think a five-part works a little bit better, um, just because of the last, you know, number five here. If you don't have number five on its own, you have to append it to number four, and it seems to me that they're best thought of separately, since they are given text. Because when we, you know, when, as we go through these judges, you'll see that every time that, that this cycle uh, is repeated, this thematic cycle is repeated, one of the things that it'll say is, you know, af after you know the judge has rescued the, the people of Israel, that they had peace for such and so time. You know, or, or they were never, you know, bothered by this people through the remainder of this time. So it's talking about a respite. Uh, you know, the people of Israel had 
the judges are an answer to trouble, more or less, and the people of Israel that had a period of peace or respite uh, after the, the ministry or during the ministry of that judge. So what is this cycle? Uh, the cycle always uh, starts toward or starts with Israel doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Um, not too much to you know, not too much to understand about that. That's difficult. Uh, if you remember when we were talking about the Exodus, that, that was probably last year or the year before that. Um, one of the things that that we, uh, well, even when we were talking about Deuteronomy, that was probably three years ago. Um, uh, when we were talking about those things, uh, one of the things that we saw very clearly was that God was was demanding from the Israelites uh, fidelity to the covenant, to the law that he had given to them through Moses. And one of the things that was really um, emphasized during all of that time in the Exodus wanderings was that they were going into a place where the people were wicked. And because of the wickedness of those people, the ripeness of their judgment had come. Israel was coming into their lands kind of as the judgment of God, the scourge of God. And um, the reason that these people were being judged the way that they were was for you know, the generations of idolatry and wickedness associated with idolatry that they had, that they had uh, done in, in the land. And so the Israelites were, were told, don't do the things that they do. Don't adopt the ways that they live by. Don't don't worship the gods that they worship. Don't get involved with the idolatry that they are involved with. Don't do that. But when Israel got into the land, right, uh, more or less got settled into houses, uh, that's exactly what they did. And uh, they no sooner, they no sooner, you know, sat back and, and enjoyed the, the shade of their own fig tree. <laughs> Uh, that they were uh, that they were already on the way out as far as falling spiritually, falling to the temptations of idolatry, falling to not being faithful to God, not being uh, not being um, loyal uniquely to God, becoming very syncretic, uh, using their almost like Adam and Eve did right in the garden as they were tempted, the devil was there trying to put down the character of God, and what, what did Adam and Eve think? Ah, that doesn't, that doesn't seem right to me. You know, they were using their own mind, basically, to judge God. And so, you know, that, that, that's a very human thing. That's very much a part of human nature, particularly fallen human nature. And so Israel kept on going into these situations, these periods of times where they, I don't want to say fell asleep spiritually, but they... They, they at least um, wandered from loyalty to God. Uh, they wandered away from being loyal to God and true to his word. And when that happened, God would visit upon them trouble, which is uh, point number two. Israel was defeated and denigrated by their enemies. That's, that was their clue, uh, cue. Clue? Yeah, clue. That was their clue that God was upset. Um, they weren't paying any attention to God while they were doing evil in his sight. And so in that space of time, if anything, you know, if their existence would have continued on the same pattern, you know, if the days would have been the same, if they were able to you know, do their crops and <coughs> have their harvest, and they were able to raise their families and just, you know, buy and sell things and and just continue living on in the normal course of affairs, would they have ever you know, thought about the evil of their ways? Had, would they have ever um, come to the place where, where, where they were in a position to say, wait a minute, we're not living the way we need to. No, they wouldn't have. So how did, how did God <coughs> more or less, I won't say that he coerced them, but he strongly coaxed them. <laughs> and he did, this, he did this by bringing something that would get their attention. What got their attention was enemies overrunning them, enemies coming and stealing their stuff, enemies coming and enslaving them, enemies coming and killing them. 
And so <laughs> Israel would do evil in the sight of the Lord. They would bring themselves into a, a place where they were basically a stench to God. And God would send their way these, these enemy forces from a variety of, of people. Some, sometimes it was the Moabites. Sometimes it was the Midianites. Sometimes it was Canaanites. Sometimes it was Philistines. Uh, sometimes it was folks from Mesopotamia. Um, but um, folks would come, invaders would come, and the invaders were God's judgment on, on Israel for the wickedness that they had been doing in the sight of the Lord. So the first stage of the cycle was Israel would go astray. They would do evil in the sight of the Lord. The second part of... <coughs> maybe I shouldn't have taken that little sip of water. Uh, the second part of the cycle was that Israel was defeated and denigrated by their enemies. And then the third uh, part of the cycle that gets repeated throughout the book of uh, Judges is that Israel in their misery would cry out to God. God, where are you? God, send us help. God, we're dying. Heck, you see us dying. You know, this, you know, this is miserable. Please help us. You know, whatever. However they were crying, they were crying in such ways as that. Um, they would cry out to the Lord. And, um, you know, it, it's, uh, when we look at some of these things, we'll see that some of these cycles lasted a fairly long time. And when I say the uh, cycles lasted, I mean the point two and point three of it. Sometimes the, they actually took a little, a little while to resolve, years sometimes, where, where Israel was, was being... Um, hammered by enemies over quite a space of time. And, you know, during that time, they would start crying out, and it took a, you know, a bit of space of time sometimes for that to resolve into some kind of a move by God uh, to alleviate their situation. Now, how did God alleviate their situation? He did it by number four. God would raise up a deliverer for them. Now, when we talk about the judge, um, you know, of course, that's the name of the book here. Uh, in the Old Testament, we see the word judge used a lot, um, used of a person and used of an activity. And oftentimes we get confused by it because we have a notion of what those words mean and what that activity means in our day and age. And that has nothing at all to do with the way that word's used in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, a judge is basically a, a chieftain. He's a, a, a ruler. Now, he did dispense justice to some degree in, that, in that, that role, but it wasn't his chief role. Now, in our society, when we think of a judge, we think of a guy or a woman with a black robe in court, you know, making decisions about how a court proceeding goes on and, you know, maybe even making verdicts uh, one way or another in a case that's being presented. And that's, when we think about a judge, that's what we think about. Someone who is interpreting the law and, and making decisions, uh, passing you know, judgment uh, on a case that's brought before them. That, if that's your understanding of judging, you'll be completely and utterly wrong in your understanding about what was going on in the Old Testament. Um, a judge, in this case, someone judging Israel, someone leading Israel, someone who is... Um, providing the military and the civic leadership to this group of people so that they can become a cohesive uh, a group of people, a nation, uh, if you will, um, a, a tribe, and, and have some ability to act corporately to affect their situation. Now, you know, the biggest thing that, it, that, that a judge brings to the table in that regard is that the one thing that is a theme in this book, and we, we saw that you know, when we were talking about those verses up above, is when, when it said that everybody was doing right in their own eyes, what, you know, what, what comes off of that as, as far as society? If everybody does what's right in their own eyes, and there's, there's no civic authority kind of uh, enforcing uh, any kind of unity or, or commonality, what do you get? Yeah. yeah, you get chaos. Human beings, if they're going to live in, in 
in Congress with each other, right? If they're going to be connected to each other close enough that they have impact and effect on, on other people's lives, you need an arbiter, right? You need not only someone who, who can make a decision between people that are not seeing things the same way, but you also need someone who, to knock heads together. It's, it's just one of those things that, that has to be done. So when you think of judge, when you think of judge, judges in the, judge, the book of judges, don't think of black robe, white wig, you know, little gavel. <laughs> I call this court to order, order in the court, you know, none of that, or, or if you're as old as I am, you would think back to maybe Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In and maybe Sammy Davis Jr. you know, dancing in in a black robe with his white wig, order in the courtroom, here comes the judge. But anyhow, that's not a judge uh, as far as judges, as far as the Old Testament. We're talking basically about uh, a, a chieftain, um, a ruler, someone who is managing civil and uh, military leadership uh, over a people. So uh, God raised up uh, a deliverer. Oh, I don't have the ER on the end of that. I'll have to fix that. Uh, God raised up a deliverer to judge them. So they, they would do evil. God would basically just open up the gateways and say to all of the bad doers around them, come on in, <laughs> have at them. They would cry out to the Lord. And God would respond by sending to them a deliverer to judge Israel. Now, um, what, did, what did the judges do? Well, most of them are very clearly um, spoken of as experiencing something supernatural. Right? Something supernatural. Things that, it's either sometimes in the technique that they used was directed by God and it made no sense. Or um, they just... Um, they just had a, a, some kind of, a, of the right spirit at the right moment that they were able to rise up and at the precise moment that, that something could make a difference, they made that difference. Or sometimes they just had a, a, you know, just an awesome display of the power of God uh, working in their lives. So, you know, sometimes it was, it was a, a, a more longer duration of that kind of thing. Sometimes it was a shorter duration. But generally speaking, when God raised up a judge, uh, you know, at least the ones that are developed, that their stories are developed in judges, what we see is that that um, they were, you know, usually um, uh, clearly depicted as following after a supernatural inspiration, a supernatural instruction, a supernatural vision, and so it, you know, very much God was the thing that was making those judges be able to bring that deliverance. Right? People cried out to God. And God expressed his answer through um, the ministry and the life of a judge. And after that judge um, brought a, a suitable uh, period of victory to Israel, then under that judge there would be a, that respite that we were talking about. There would be that time where things seemed to be going well. They, you know, the, the enemies were chased away, were vanquished. Uh, the bad things that were happening were no longer happening, and, and there was a, a period of you know calm and peace. And sometimes it would last for you know a few years. Sometimes it would last for you know a little bit longer period of time. But that's that's basically the cycle. There we go. This is our judge list. These are the twelve: um, Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah, Gideon. We say Gideon. Jewish people would say it's Gidon, but that's, we'll say Gideon. Uh, Tola, uh, there again, uh, we'll say Jair, but a, a good Hebrew would say Yair. Uh, Yair. Uh, same thing with, we say Jephthah, generally speaking, amongst English speakers, right? You know, Hebrew would say uh, that's Yiftah, and they would go <laughs> at the end. <laughs> um, Ibs, uh, Ibsan, and uh, that actually has a uh, that actually has a sound in there. Ibsan, Ibsan, uh, and Abdon, Abdown, and then, and then Samson. And of course, it, when you listen to Hebrews say Samson, it doesn't sound like anything like Samson because they got all kinds of S's in there instead of S's, and so it's it's a completely 
different uh, word. But we all, we all see it and understand it as Samson, so that works well. But these are the 12, and from that list, how many names do you recognize? How many of you recognize two names? How many of you recognize three names? Four names. What is it? But that's the list of the 12. This is the ones that we'll be uh, working our way through. Some of them have great stories. Everybody, you know, we all know the story of Gideon for the most part. Um, we probably all know the story of Deborah, right? Um, probably Samson would be the other one that everyone's pretty familiar with, right? Because we always throw Delilah in there, <laughs> Samson and Delilah. Well, I don't know if Delilah deserves to have equal billing with Samson, but that's the list of the judges. Um, these are the ones that we will be looking at as we work our way through the book. And then um, we'll look at uh, dating the judges. I, I've got a lot of scripture verses up here on this slide, and uh, you know I'll read those through for you. Um, I said that there was problems dating judges, and the problem... <coughs> The problems lie in, in a combination of trying to come out of the exodus and the, the dates that we have, the years that we have for those periods, and then getting to the temple period, the first temple period when Solomon was building the temple in Jerusalem. And we have some numbers there, and then we have some New Testament references to these periods. And really, to tell you the truth, it, it's they're kind of all over the map a little bit, and it's a little bit difficult uh, to put it all together. I think that it all, all does go together um, at least pretty closely and so you know let's see what we can do with this. Uh, we'll start at the top there. Um, <clears throat> this is out of the book of Genesis chapter 15 uh, verse number 13. This is uh, God speaking to Abraham. Um, then the Lord said to him, know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. Um, so we have that particular thing. Now, most people, uh, I, that I, at least conservative uh, scholars, uh, most people interpret that 400 years to be uh, taken uh, no other way than to say that the Israelites were in slavery in Egypt for 400 years. Now, when we were dealing this, doing the study on, on the Exodus, if you remember at all the kind of the things that I was dealing with about that at that point in time, it's really hard to get a 400-year period of slavery in Egypt to work with the dates. It doesn't seem like that's what's meant. Um, so when God was saying this to Abraham, it, it's, it's hard to see that what he meant was that the 400 years was all in Egypt in slavery. Um, it's, it, because if you do that, uh, you just run into not only problems biblically, but you run into problems with extra biblical history as well. So it's a, that's a very difficult thing to interpret that way. We'll see as we look through these, these various other scriptures that other people inspired by the Holy Spirit did not interpret it that way. So why should, why should we would be my question. Um, then we go on to the second one here. This is out of the book of Exodus. Um, the time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt and Canaan, you see the little red there. Uh, why, did, uh, why is that there? Because if you look for that in your English Bible, uh, you won't see and Canaan there. Um, but if you look at the Septuagint, now if you uh, remember what the Septuagint was, the Septuagint was the Greek Bible, the Greek Old Testament that was translated around maybe 250 BC, someplace around there, was translated in Alexandria, Egypt. And there was a big, big Jewish community there. Um, basically, the Holy Spirit is the, the ruler and guider of how the New Testament writers were led to do what they did. And um, generally speaking, when they quoted the Old Testament, they quoted the Septuagint. So uh, in the Septuagint, in this particular text, like Exodus chapter 12, verses 40 and 41, um, in the Septuagint, and Canaan is there in that phrase. So it, that's why it's there. The time that the people lived in Israel, or uh, the time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt and Canaan, 
was 430 years. At the end of 430 years on that very day, all the host of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Now what this would say is that the 400 years, 430 years specifically, that the 430 years that was being spoken of, alluded to in, in Genesis chapter 15, did not start in Egypt. It started from the time Abraham was covenanted with God in the promised land. Right? There was some period of time after Abraham was in the promised land before, before Joseph was carried off to slavery, and then there was some period of time from the time that Joseph came into Egypt until Jacob and the rest of Israel came into Egypt with him. Right? And so all of those things were working. Uh, what this, what uh, this text uh, seems to say is that the, the years, the 430 years, is not just time in Egypt, but time going back to Abraham and Egypt. Okay, so that's why the Septuagint in this particular case is very helpful. Um, then we go on. You still with me? Okay. All right, we're reading, reading, reading. Uh, the God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. For about 40 years, he endured their conduct in the wilderness, and he overthrew seven nations in Canaan, giving their land to his people as their inheritance. All this took about 450 years. Um, after this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. Now that is out of a sermon that the Apostle Paul is preaching in Acts chapter 13. And in, in talking about it there, he uses this number 450 years. Now that's different than either of those numbers, um, but he adds a couple of things right to it. He says that, this, that when he talks about 450 years, he's talking about the time it took Joshua to lead the conquest. He's talking about the time, the 40 years that it took to be in the wilderness. And then he's talking about that standard of 400 years that we have from the, you know, those other two references in the Old Testament. Um, then they, they more or less come together. So uh, perhaps you could rough, you know, rough that in a little bit and say that if, you know, if that's the case, and I think that it clearly is, that that 50 years here would be something that you could maybe attribute to the fact that that's how long the Exodus and the conquest took. Um, some people say the conquest took about seven years. Some people say it took a little bit longer. Um, Ten years is certainly, you know, uh, a rough age for that. So that's what that's talking about. And then this is out of the book of Galatians, uh, chapter three. The law introduced 430 years later. So here's this number again. That's definitely. He, where is he getting that number? He's definitely getting it from from Exodus. Um, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and uh, thus do away with the promise. Now, where do you get the 430 years and the 400 years, uh, um, you know, the numbers, where do those all come from? Uh, there's, a couple of, there's a couple of spans that that you have to take into account to try to work this all out. One of those spans is the time from Abraham to the time of Joseph, right? So you have that span. You can get a pretty good approximation, uh, you know, of, of that period of time, and, 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 you know, if you would go through and work out all the genealogies and whatnot. You also have, then, the time that Joseph was in Egypt alone. Because he, he got sold when he was about 17, and it was about 39, he was about 39 when his brother, about 22 years later, when his, when his brothers came uh, into Egypt. And that's a great story. You, you know, everyone remembers that story and how Joseph kind of toyed with them and played with them. Uh, <laughs> uh, it turned out really well for everyone involved, right? Um, so there's that, and then there's the time in, in, uh, in Slavery that that Israel spent, which was not at the very beginning of their time. They weren't in slavery for 400 years. They were only in slavery for some time after that because while Joseph was alive, and he lived pretty long, he lived into his hundreds. And so while Joseph was alive, and there shortly thereafter, 
things were going really well for them. You know, they were, they, Joseph was well known with the royal family and whatnot, and everything was working out very much to their favor. They had that wonderful green area of Goshen to live in. The, the Egyptians didn't want to be anywhere near because that's where the sheep were. And the Egyptians hated shepherds. They didn't want to be around sheep, and they didn't want to be around shepherds. And so they actually got like the best of the land, probably, you know, a few more mosquitoes and whatnot, but they actually got the best of the land to live in just because, you know, there was a lot of grazing ground there, and it was a good place for sheep. So there was some time that they were living without slavery, and then there was a time when they came into slavery. A, a, a ruler arose who did not know Joseph, and decided that they were a threat, and the way to deal with them was to enslave them. So they were enslaved. And then, after that, they were delivered uh, when Moses came and, and brought them out. And then, of course, we know about the Exodus. Now, the law, the law was given to Moses about two years after the Exodus. So there's an, another little number that works in there. So you have these numbers, I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that they're, they're approximations. Uh, now it says 430 years to the day. That seems like that 430 years is looking at something very specific, and very exact. It's very hard to come up with really precise dates. There always seems to be a little bit of wiggle room as far as when one thing starts and another thing ends. There always seems to be a little bit of maybe rounding off or an inexactitude. In, in putting forth some of these numbers, and it can be very difficult as a result to get a handle on when the period of Judges began. That's only part of the problem. Because if you know when the period of Judges began, um, you have enough clues that you can get a pretty good idea of maybe where, when it ended. We have another reference about something different, but it encapsulates the period of Judges. This is found in the book of uh, 1 Kings, chapter 6, verse number 1. In the 480th year after the Israelites came out of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign, there, so there's a lot of points there, right? A lot of data points there. Uh, Solomon's reign over Israel in the month of Ziv, uh, the second month, he began to build the temple of the Lord. And it took him about 11 years to get that done. So uh, you have there another period of time was it saying you, you go back 480 years from that time to the time that the Egypt, uh, that the Israelites came out of Egypt so what's what's involved with that 480 years well uh, the, the very bottom line there I'll come back to the other things but the very bottom line there kind of gives you an idea of what you're trying to fit into there 480 years you have to, you know, that includes the Exodus. That was 40 years, right? That includes the conquest, which could have been, you know, maybe 10 years, right? That includes the ministry of Eli. That includes the ministry of Samuel. And that includes the ministry of Saul, and that, or the kingship of Saul. And that includes the kingship of David. And as it said here, four months into Solomon's reign. So all of that is included in that 480 years. So, uh, why do I say all of that? Well, there are some folks that look at the numbers inside of Judges and, and, and will come up with numbers. And I've, I've seen estimates in the 500s, like 560 some years or whatever for the period of time of the Judges. And it's like, no, that's impossible. It, it can't be that. We're told it was only 480 years from them leaving Egypt to the, to the time he built the temple. We have a pretty good date, at least, People think that we do, of 966 for the building of the temple. Um, I don't think that that's, I think that's probably 50 years off, and I think it was actually earlier than that. But, but um, we'll, we'll go with the experts and say 966. Um, the judges were not 500 and some years, they weren't 400 and some years. If you look at all the things that you have to include in that 480 years, uh, you're talking maybe 300, 325 years, you know, someplace in that area, at the most 350, 360, something of that nature. So, you know, if we, if we want to hit the center point of all of that, maybe, maybe around 325 years. That's, 
that's not a bad estimate for the period of judges. So, you know, it's just part of the, the you know, the problems with dating it. Now, um, Paul states that uh, 430 years passed between the Abraham covenant and the law of Moses. So, when he says 430 years in, in Galatians, he, he gives you what he's measuring it from. And that's the Abrahamic covenant to the law of Moses. Now, there are, there are only a couple of ways to see that. You can see that as referring to Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 15, or the, all of those various places where the very covenant that Abraham was sworn to, then after him Isaac was sworn to, and then after him Jacob was sworn to, because God kept on renewing that covenant with each generation of patriarch. So, you know, any of those, any of those could be, uh, you know, a target for that. But that's what that 430 represent. Um, if, that, if it represents that, um, and I don't think Paul was wrong, not even a little on this, then what it means is they were not 400 years in Egypt. They were not 400 years in slavery. That was just a way of stating the, the extent of the period uh, involved and that that period happened to include a period of slavery in, in Egypt. So. Uh, I think that's the way to take that. According to the genealogies, and I think this is a very telling thing, uh, the elders of Egypt, only four generations passed from Jacob to Moses. So if you go to the genealogies um, and you're coming, you know, we know Jacob took all of his family, 70-some souls, right, all of the family to Egypt eventually. Joseph was already there. But all of them, um, we have genealogies coming from all of them to their sons and their sons and their sons. And there's only four generations, from Jacob to Moses. That's it. How long does it take to go through four generations? Maybe 60 years, if it's a long time. Maybe a lot less. Get the point that I'm making, right? The, the, the genealogies, I think, would point to a lot less time being spent in Egypt than, than the actual 400 years. And then Usher's dating. Usher was a, a big, a lot of work with trying to date various things, like the creation and stuff like that. He uh, dates it 215 years in Canaan under the patriarchs, and then 215 years in Egypt, some of which ended up being spent in slavery. Um, I won't worry about the 1800 BC. Um, when Paul said about uh, 450 years, he was including the Egyptian sojourn, their time in Egypt, the exodus, and the conquest. So um, all of those things kind of bounce around and they, they, they add to the, the thought that I'm coming to at the very end here, and that is just that probably the period of the judges was about 320.